Hey there, I hope all of you are doing well and hope you're having a good week and I hope to see you on Sunday if at all possible. We have added the second service, of course, a couple weeks ago, so we're now meeting together at 9 a.m. and also at 10.30 a.m. every Lord's Day morning. And so if you can join us at 9 or at 10.30 this Sunday, please take the time to sign up online. That really helps us. We've had visitors almost at every service so for the last few months. If you do not have internet access or if you need any help with the sign-up process, please get in touch either with me or with Kenna. We'd be glad to help you. And uh, just to put your name down there, just so we kind of have a count of who's able to attend. But thank you so much uh, for your help with that. We really appreciate all the sign-ins and that helps us to uh, do some planning. Uh, I am all alone here at the house today. This is uh, just a strange thing and I don't really know how to feel about this. It's been almost a year, it seems like. But of course, our daughter's at college. My son left for work a couple hours ago. I'm here by myself. It's Wednesday mid-morning right now. And my wife is back to teaching in the school. So they are in the actual school building this week for the first time in uh, just over a year. And so it has been eerily quiet around this place for the past several hours. Just me and the dog hanging out. And so if there is a UPS truck, uh, also known as a murder van at our house, um, she will let us know about that. So I hope she can be quiet for the next uh, 45 minutes or so. But that's the way it is. Just me and the dog hanging out here today. But I'm thankful for the change of pace, I guess. A little bit different today. In terms of my own good news this week, I enjoyed my first bike ride of the season this past Monday. 14.2 miles from our house to the UW Hospital and back home. I got to see Stacy, got to drop off some cards as well as a gift from the congregation. And as I was waiting there for about two minutes, waiting for her to come down from the room upstairs, uh, I checked Facebook and learned that the Schmudlocks were practically next door at the Children's Hospital uh, for an appointment there. And so I just uh, sent a quick message to Norma Jean real quick, got to meet her out front of the Children's Hospital for a few minutes. And I can't believe the timing and how that worked out. Just a random thing. And it was uh, great to get to see her and uh, hope things are going well for her. They got some good news this week, and so we're thankful for that. But that was a good day, and so I uh, got to ride my bike and do a couple visits on the on the bike at the hospitals downtown, and it was just pleasant weather. And I'm kind of still feeling it for a couple days after uh, riding for the first time in, in quite a few months. Uh, Monday also happened to mark 21 years since we first came up to Madison to serve the Four Lakes congregation. I think we commuted from Janesville for a week or two. It's kind of a blur. It's been so long ago, but before we moved into an apartment up here and uh, on the southwest side of Madison off of Raymond and McKenna, right in that area. Uh, some of you may remember there was, a, I think, a bank robbery at that bank. It's not a bank now, but right there on the corner across from, from Quick Trip, what was then PDQ. Um, and we came back after unloading our stuff and had the apartment building on Tottenham surrounded by police officers with their guns drawn. And that was our welcome to the city of Madison, I think, that first night after all of you helped us move in. But that was 21 years ago, and uh, we're thankful you've been so patient with us through the years. So our first day with all of you was April 12, 2000, and we met that night for Bible class. And my first experience here uh, full-time was that night at Mimi's apartment over on Finmright Drive. And so I've got some good memories this week, and I've been thinking about some of those early years over the past several days here. So I uh, thank you for those good memories. Uh, tonight, we return to our study of the book of Acts. And Acts, of course, is a history of the early church written by a man by the name of Luke, and he's writing to a man by the name of Theophilus. So the book of Luke is volume one, all about Jesus. The book of Acts is volume two, the history of the early church. And Luke, of course, is the beloved physician. Up to this point in the book, we have looked at the first two chapters. And in the ABCs of Acts, you may remember from a few weeks ago, we summarized chapter one with the word ascension, referring to the ascension of Jesus back into heaven. We could have also used apostle appointed. That would have been a very appropriate label for chapter one, apostle appointed, as the apostles picked uh, a man to replace Judas in Acts chapter one. But ascension is basically what happens in chapter one. And then over the past two weeks, we looked at Acts chapter two, and we noted that Acts 2 records the beginning of the church. And so B in the Acts of the Apostles or the ABCs of Acts, B stands for the beginning of the church. A week or two ago, one of you suggested baptism 
as a good summary of chapter 2. And that would also be just very, very appropriate because 3,000 people were baptized in Acts chapter 2. Believers baptized or baptism, something like that, would be very appropriate. If you've thought of a better one than that, I hope you will share it. But in my mind, the way I learned this from the time I was young, ascension and then beginning of the church. But if, again, if you have any better... Uh, feel free to let me know, put it in the comments on the YouTube video or on the Facebook post, and I'll try to share that in the near future here. In chapter 2, we have the 12 apostles baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then we have Peter preaching to this huge crowd that's come together to Jerusalem for Pentecost. He accuses them of murdering the Son of God, and in response to this, they interrupt his sermon, and they ask, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter's response, of course, is repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And he continues with more uh, exhortation, warning them to be saved from this perverse generation. So we assume he goes into some explanation of what repentance means for them, just as John the Baptist did. And uh, ultimately, as he continues, 3,000 people are baptized before that first day is over. And then the early Christians stick around in Jerusalem for a while, listening to the apostles' teaching and fellowshipping with each other and sharing their possessions with those in need. Well, tonight we continue in our study of Acts with a study of Acts chapter 3. And the first paragraph in Acts 3 is Acts 3 verses 1 through 10. And as you might be able to see on the screen, I've added the next summary on the ABCs as cripple cured cripple cured and as i have alluded to over the past two weeks we need a better one here we need an improvement some translations actually use the word cripple to describe the man who is healed in this passage but we usually don't refer to people as being crippled these days do we uh, to some this might be offensive and certainly we understand that uh, we know though that language evolves doesn't it a term that is widely accepted in one time and place uh, might fall out of favor over time and might even end up sounding a bit vulgar. Uh, I think of this sermon series that we're in the middle of right now, the sermon series on Balaam. Uh, some of the other translations don't refer to Balaam's donkey as being a donkey, if you know what I mean. And so it wasn't he, uh, it wasn't his donkey that was talking to him. It was his, you know what, talking to him. He wasn't beating his donkey. He was beating his, you know what, on the road. So uh, this isn't meant to condemn some of those older translations. They were groundbreaking at the time. Uh, but I'm just pointing out that some terms that were used then, many years ago, uh, we no longer use in the same way now. And in the same way, we have the word cripple in some of the translations. I looked up the etymology, that is like the history, the background of the word cripple, and it actually goes back to an old English word referring to one who creeps, one who halts or limps, one partly or wholly deprived of the use of one or more limbs. So a creeper, we might say. It seems to literally refer to something that is crooked or bent. That is the ultimate history or the definition of that word. And that was applied to people who were crooked or bent. That's the way it got started roughly a thousand years ago. And it's tied to similar words in ancient versions of German, Norse, and Dutch. And so those three language families have this word cripple in common going back uh, many hundreds of years. The other issue with the summary here, as I learned it back in the 80s, is that we aren't using first-person type language. As many of us know, uh, we're generally trying to get away from describing people primarily in terms of some issue that they have. In other words, instead of referring to somebody as a leper, he's a leper, it's generally considered better to refer to a person who has leprosy. Instead of saying he's autistic, it's generally better to describe a person who has autism. And so instead of calling me ugly, uh, I would prefer that you describe me as a person having ugliness. Uh, of course, I'm totally kidding there. Everybody knows I'm handsome. Uh, since nobody's here in the house to, uh, to contradict that, I guess I can get away with that. Uh, but I think you understand what, I, what I'm talking about there. Cripple cured is not exactly the best way of saying that. It's not ideal in a number of ways. 
However, for the past 30 plus years, that two word combination has helped me personally to remember what happens in Acts chapter three. And so in that sense, it works. Uh, but moving forward, I hope that you will share some alternatives, summarizing what happens in Acts chapter three with a word that starts with C. And I've thought and I've thought, I have another one I'll share a little bit later tonight if I can remember to do that. But uh, if you have any improvements on that, I would love to hear it. Uh, something summarizing chapter three with a word that starts with the letter C. So if, if you have that, share it online or send it to me privately in a text or an email. So let's get to the text. This is Acts chapter three, verses one through 10. Acts three, verses one through 10. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. And a man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along, whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, in order to beg alms of those who were entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began asking to receive alms. But Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him and said, Look at us. And he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, walk. And seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were strengthened. With a leap, he stood upright and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they were taking note of him as being the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Well, before we get to the details of this text, I want to just briefly make a few comments on the temple itself, especially since Luke starts out here by telling us that this happens in the temple. And of course, for the first readers of this book, uh, many of them had perhaps seen the temple, they had walked by it, they had seen it from a distance, some perhaps had been in it, and so they were familiar with it. That, of course, is no longer the case today. And so we need to know that the temple in this passage is not the original temple built by King Solomon back in the 900s BC. That temple, of course, was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BC as a result of God's people turning away from God toward the worship of idols and all kinds of other things they were doing, ignoring the poor, a series of injustices against uh, certain groups. And so they were wiped off the face of the earth. Many of them, many others were transferred over to 70 years of Babylonian captivity. Well, since that temple was destroyed, the second temple, as it is usually known, was rebuilt mainly by Zerubbabel after the people returned from that captivity. And it was a poor shadow of the previous temple. In fact, uh, some of the old men who came back were actually weeping when they saw it completed because it just paled in comparison to the glory of Solomon's temple. That's the way I would take that passage. Well, in my mind, I think of the temple pictured here in the model form on your screen as Herod's temple. And I, I always thought about the temp this temple, Herod's temple, the temple Jesus was familiar with as being the third temple. And so we've got Solomon's temple number one, Zerubbabel's temple, the rebuilt version as being temple number two, and then Herod's temple being temple number three. Uh, but apparently most Jewish people do not think of it like that. And the reason is when King Herod built the final version of the temple from roughly 20 to 10 BC, it was more of a massive remodel and expansion. And so we didn't really start from scratch. And so they don't consider Herod's temple to be the third. They consider it to be the second. In fact, he had an agreement, King Herod did, he had an agreement with the priests that sacrifices would continue uninterrupted throughout that process. Herod was an evil man, but he was in charge of this whole area and he wanted to spend massive amounts of money on, uh, on infrastructure, we might say, kind of to win the hearts of the people. I will spend your own money in this way so you can love me even more. It's kind of King Herod's uh, version of that. And so he's like, I will build you people a temple. 
and he does this, but they were hesitant. They were obviously welcoming the fund, uh, funding to get in there to rebuild this temple. It was in need of an upgrade. It was never really as good as Solomon's temple. And so they were in favor of that, but they said, we'll let you do this on the condition that it not interrupt the sacrifices, that we can continue on continually through the construction process uh, with the sacrifice. It's kind of like remodeling your kitchen and still being able to cook through the whole process. That was their challenge for Herod. And Herod said, okay, we've got a deal. I'll do this. It'll take a decade or two, uh, but we'll get it done and you can continue with your traditions. Well, anyway, this is it. This is a, a model of it anyway, a scale model. Uh, just to the upper right of the outer outline. I don't know if you can make a little uh, fortress or a castle looking structure with the towers. That is the Antonia Fortress. And that was built by Herod so that he could maintain a military presence on such an important site. So I'll build you people a temple, but I'm going to attach a little fort here on the side of it so I can keep an eye on you people. So you see how this is going. I'll spend millions and millions or whatever on your little project here, but I'm going to put myself a little uh, fort kind of attached like a tumor over on the side of it. Well, uh, that was important to Herod to do to maintain law and order. It was a very volatile site. A lot of stuff could happen there. Um, inside the outer walls, the, the cube-like structure right there in the middle is the temple itself, including the holy place farthest from us in this uh, vantage point and then the well the most holy place is the farthest and then the holy place in front of that inside the building itself uh, outside of that in front of that is the court of uh, of women which as you can imagine is where the women were allowed to be everyone was allowed to be in the court of women but the men could go further there was another uh, court between the court of the women and the holy place and so the men were allowed to go further to get closer to the temple itself uh, but the women were limited to that outer court and then the large courtyard surrounding all of this, and yet inside the, the wall or the fencing there, um, that would be known as the Court of the Gentiles. And that's the, the massive, to me it looks like marble, big old courtyard area in the outside there. So the Court of the Gentiles. Obviously, it, could, it wasn't just Gentiles. It was men, women, Jewish, Gentile, everybody almost could be in that outer court. But the Gentiles could not go any further than that. They were limited. The, the Jewish women and the Jewish men could go further, and the Jewish men could go even further than the women. So it was like a series of concentric squares, uh, one inside the other, where people were not allowed to go past certain points. As to the beautiful gate that's referred to by Luke, we really don't have that reference anywhere outside of Luke, at least yet. And so... There's been some speculation as to what exactly Luke was talking about here. Where was this man healed? It was a gate. There were many gates in the temple. So it was one of the gates in that temple complex. Uh, some good arguments have been made. Some people say, oh, it was this one. Somebody else says, no, for this reason, it was this other gate or whatever. But we would really need to spend too much time to fully understand even the most likely possibilities here. If you're interested I would suggest just going online and searching for a beautiful gate and, and you will find some of the uh, voluminous research that has been done through the years where everybody has their favorite theory as to exactly what gate it was. We've actually discovered a part of a warning sign from the temple complex that was posted on that inner wall between the court of the Gentiles and the court of the women. And I didn't look this up, as I remember it said something to the effect that if you are a Gentile and you get killed for crossing this line, you have chosen your own death. Your life is in your own hands. In other words, if you cross this line and you die, uh, don't blame us. And years ago, that stone was actually loaned to the Jewish Museum of Cleveland. And I made a point of seeing it on one of our trips over there to see my in-laws, my uh, I guess call her my grandmother-in-law lived in Illyria, about uh, 20 minutes straight west of Cleveland. And this Jewish museum, as I remember, was kind of on the southeast side of Cleveland. And I took a day to go down there and look at some of these uh, artifacts that were on, uh, on loan from the uh, museum in Jerusalem. And that stone was actually there, a uh, warning of the death penalty, basically, if you cross that line from one of these sections into the other. And this reminds us that this building no longer exists. There's a reason why we only have a model of it. It was completely torn down by the Romans in 70 AD, just as Jesus had predicted. Remember, he said, not one stone left on top of another. And that's exactly what happened. That building 
uh, ceased to exist. Um, this is a picture of what the temple area looks like now. Uh, this is this was a picture taken in 2013, I believe, so just a few years ago, but still fairly modern. You can see some of the neighborhoods and the streets around it, and you can uh, see the general area, the Temple Mount, as it is called, but the temple itself is completely gone. The Romans scraped it off the face of the earth. Some of those buildings were covered in gold. They set it on fire. Some of the speculation is the Romans then dug through that rubble, not one stone left on top of another, in order to get to some of that gold that had melted down into the cracks. And so that fulfilled the prophecy of Jesus uh, perfectly. In the place of the temple today, we now have an Islamic holy site, uh, the Dome of the Rock, which was built directly over where the most holy place used to be. So if you compare this um, to the picture of the temple or the model of the temple, you can see very roughly that the Dome of the Rock, it is over the spot where the most holy place used to be. And this is also believed by many people to be the exact place where Abraham tried to sacrifice Isaac. So you can see that this is a, a major holy site, although no place on this earth is really holy today. We are God's holy people, but I think you understand what I'm saying there. This is a, a holy place um, to three of the world's biggest religions, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And so the Dome of the Rock is up there now. And, uh, and then over to the left side, I believe that is where we have the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And so that is very significant for the Islamic people. So this is just a volatile place. There, there are arguments about who controls this area. And it's hard to do an archaeological dig here. You cannot touch a grain of sand on this hill without erupting some major world conflict. There are all kinds of conflicts tied to uh, archaeological sites. Everybody's afraid that if the other side finds something that's holy to them, then they're going to kick the other people out and so on. And so it, it's very hard to touch anything on the Temple Mount anymore. But anyway, I just wanted to give us some sense of where this is happening, this account that we're studying in Acts. So we get back to the text. We have Peter and John going up to the temple at the ninth hour. This is the hour of prayer. And remember, this is some of the acts of some of the apostles. It isn't all the acts of all the apostles. This is some of the acts of some of the apostles. We have no idea what Thomas and Bartholomew and Andrew and the others are doing. But Peter and John, we know where they are. They are in the temple and they're there at the ninth hour, about three o'clock in the afternoon, the hour of prayer. And on their way in, this man who had been unable to walk since he was born, I think in the next chapter, we're going to learn he was 40 years old. Uh, but this man who cannot walk sees Peter and John as they're about to go into the temple. And this man is apparently carried there and he's dropped off every day by somebody, family, friends, volunteers, we aren't told, but he's dropped off there every day so that he can beg. And this is what he does. He can't farm, he can't do construction, he can't earn a living. And so he begs for a living. And it seems that the temple is a pretty good place for this. People are perhaps feeling generous. They have money with them in order to offer in the temple. So they've got their money right there in their hands, ready to go in. They know that God likes this kind of thing. God likes it when we take care of the poor. And so this beggar comes here every day. This is a good spot, isn't it? If you're going to beg for money, right outside the temple gates is the place to be. The people come to me. I don't have to go door-to-door -door begging, but they will all file past me at certain times of the day. Uh, I think of visiting the Vatican in Rome. If you've been there, you know it is surrounded by a massive stone wall with gates. And the line to get in wraps around the outside of that wall for, for a number of city blocks. And in that line, we passed perhaps hundreds of people with various disabilities, missing arms and legs and um, disabled in, in uh, various ways. And they were all there begging for money from those of us who were there to visit the Vatican. And, and people were giving them money. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there. That is what people did. And so this is perhaps what is happening here. This is a high traffic area. And these are, generally speaking, religious people, um, good um, 
good moral people interested in helping the poor. So it is a perfect match, and they were able to join up in that way. Uh, by the way, if you were sick in the first century, if your legs suddenly stopped working, if you had chest pains, you know, if you had some rash or whatever, where would you go? They didn't have hospitals. They didn't have clinics like we would think of them today. They didn't have ambulances. You couldn't call 911. They didn't have the Red Cross. So where would they go? Well, where did the Good Samaritan take the man who was beaten by robbers? If you remember there from the book of Luke, he took him to an inn, a hotel of some kind, and he paid the innkeeper to take care of that man for a while. That was their version of a hospital, I guess. That's about as close as they got, I suppose. Or they would often go somewhere like the temple, begging for help, hoping that somebody might reach out and do something generous that might help their situation. And that is what this man did, apparently, for many years. So when this guy sees Peter and John about to go through the gate, he starts asking for money. Oh, we have people ask us for money today, don't we? I know we've had issues in Madison with people taking over major intersections. I know over by... Oh, Odana Road and McKenna, Gammon, whatever that little area is by West Town Mall. That's the big place um, over on the west side of town. A number of intersections around East Town Mall as well in the past. And holding up traffic, uh, going car to car. You may remember the city passed a, a law, an ordinance against this a number of years ago. And it helped for a little bit. Ultimately, people just kind of shifted around and got more mobile, a little more sneaky, I guess we might say, in what they were doing. Uh, but how do we react when somebody comes up to our car or approaches us on State Street asking for money? How do we react to that? And it depends on your history. It depends if you've been burned in the past. It depends on your level of comfort or fear in that situation. Uh, sometimes we're scared. Sometimes we're worried that anything we give might be used inappropriately, aiding some kind of addiction that has perhaps put them in this situation. It's complicated, isn't it? And there is no one right answer on how to deal with that. It may depend on the situation, our comfort level, how uh, how we're um, prepared to deal with uh, taking a risk of helping somebody like that. Um, as a church, we get many calls asking for cash. Can you help me? I need money. And our practice in the past up through the present has been to help with actual food, if at all possible. Um, we don't drop off paper bags full of cash to people. Often we found that is not helpful. That's not what needs to be done there. But as a church, we can often help with food. Uh, it takes more time and effort. It'd be a lot easier just to say, here's $100 or something like that. That'd be the easy way. But what we've tried to do is to make sure that people are not hungry, at least to the best of our ability. That's something that we can actually do. It also gives us a better chance to talk to them about Jesus. Several months ago, I was approached at the Quick Trip over on Milwaukee Street by a man asking for money. And he just came up to me as I was pumping gas and said, he said, I haven't eaten. Can you give me some money? And I said, well, I, I don't get give cash to people. I'm not able to do that. But um, I'm about to go in Quick Trip here. Um, can I get you something? Can I get you something to eat? And he said, no, no, I just I need the cash. And I said, well, I mean, I thought you said you were hungry. If, if you're really hungry, I'm telling you, I'm going in this building in 30 seconds. And if, if you need something, I, I would be more than happy to get you something from inside. And I'll, I'll bring it right out to you. And he said, okay, um, I, I could use a cheeseburger and a Pepsi. And I said, okay, I, I'll be right back. And I went inside, got him a couple of cheeseburgers and a, a Pepsi and a, a chips or something and a dessert and brought it back out there and give it gave it to him uh, i don't remember explicitly if i told him about the lord's church i tr usually try to try to give him a business card or a wooden nickel or something say hey these are good people stop by and visit us sometime if there's some other way that we can help you uh, give us a call or or whatever and anyway that's what i've tried to do instead of handing a person twenty dollars it'd be much better if we could help them in some concrete way and try to actually meet the need that they're having, having at the moment. And that's his need that he said that he had when he first approached me. He said, I'm hungry. I haven't eaten for several days. And so that's the need that I did my best to try to help. And I would rather do this than also, I would point out, I'd rather do that than paying some other organization to do it, or even the government to do it. I've often said, if I have $100 dedicated to helping somebody in need financially, 
Would I rather give, send it to Washington, D.C. and have them deal with it? Or would I rather do it through the Lord's church or personally? And obviously, I'd rather do it personally. I'd rather do it through the Lord's church. I'd rather Jesus get the credit for it uh, than the government get the credit for it, plus them taking out their 80% or whatever uh, in terms of the bu bureaucracy there. But anyway, that's the way I look at it. I'd rather help face-to-face, -face, taking the man by the hand as Peter did, looking him in the eye as these people did here as opposed to outsourcing it to some third party who may try to teach them who knows what or waste the money in other ways. It's not that we don't want to help. We want to help and know that it's actually being helpful. Uh, the same thing goes for what we try to do as a church. Again, if somebody calls the church line asking for a bag of cash, uh, our custom is we don't do that. Um, and we try to redirect that toward some physical need. If we can help with food, or in some concrete way like that, we can do that. You may remember a few years ago, one of our elders went out and bought a man a pair of boots. He was starting a brand new job, didn't have boots. He didn't have work boots. And he said, can you give me $100? Well, we're not just giving you $100 here. What size do you wear? Let me go to Walmart or Farm and Fleet or wherever it is and let's get you a pair of boots. And I hope that makes sense. We know then that that money is not wasted or squandered. And it also gives us more one-on-one -on -one time where we're able to discuss the Lord in those situations. And many times, due to the generosity of all of you in your weekly giving, we've been able to go out to Aldi or Woodman's and just buy a week's worth of groceries. What we would eat for a week, that's what we do. We'll go to Woodman's, we'll go to Aldi, and we'll, I'll buy what I would buy for a week of our family put it in a box, and then drop that off at the front door and have a brief conversation at someone's front door. I'd much rather do that uh, than send the money through some uh, man-made organization. Uh, many times, though, when they hear that we're not able to give cash, they immediately hang up. I think of what Peter says here, you know, silver and gold have I none. Click is the way it often goes when they call the church line. Uh, and they don't even hang around for the rest of the explanation of the ways that we actually can help. Some actually get angry. Uh, but some, though, are truly in need, and we do the best that we can to help in some way. And at the same time, we're also able to explain that the help doesn't really come from us. This is not me giving you this thing or the, this box of groceries. This is the Lord's church. This is God's people are doing this. And this is coming from the Lord. Uh, through the congregation. And, and that's what happens here in Acts chapter 3. In Acts 3, Peter and John are approached in a somewhat similar way. Uh, this man who cannot walk is calling out. He's asking for money. So like those people at the stoplights here in Madison, he's making eye contact. He's looking them in the eye and he's, he's focusing. Uh, Peter and John stop. They look at the man. They say to him, look at us. In other words, let's talk a bit. This is a crowded entryway. Thousands of people streaming in. And the man gets excited, it seems, you know, thinking, this is it. I'm about to get, this is a good one. Going to get a big one here. But Peter says, I do not possess silver and gold. But what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene walk. Notice how they put the, the attention not on themselves. This is not me, Peter, doing this thing for you. This is Jesus. This is all about Jesus. Were the apostles wealthy people? No, they weren't. Several were commercial fishermen. Uh, others had normal jobs, we might say. What did Jesus say about rich people? It is easier for what? For a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's not a sin to be rich, but for the most part, the apostles were not wealthy people. They did not have silver and gold, but what they did have, they shared. In verse 7, we find that Peter reaches out and he grabs this man by the right hand and lifts him up. And immediately, the man's feet and ankles are strengthened. And it's interesting to me that Luke, as a medical doctor, gives us a few details in this passage that others might not have mentioned. Uh, the fact that he had been this way since birth, the fact that Peter takes him not just by the hand, but by the right hand, and the fact that the issue is specifically with the man's feet and his ankles. And then he doesn't just stand up, but he gets up with a leap. And then not only does he stand upright and begin to walk, but he enters the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. This man is over the top excited. 
As I remember it, the priests and the Levites were not allowed to serve in the temple if they had some kind of physical deformity, and there's speculation that this extended to worshipers entering into certain parts of the temple. And so there's a chance that this is why this man is at the gate. This is as far as he can go. And there's also a chance that this is what contributes to his excitement here. He's going inside for the first time in his life. I wouldn't swear my soul on that. I'm just saying uh, that some have studied this and have suggested this as a possibility. Neil Pollard wrote an article on this several years ago suggesting that we should probably come to worship each Lord's Day with the same attitude, walking and leaping and praising God. Not necessarily literally, but with the attitude just of extreme thankfulness. I am so happy to be together with God's people, worshiping God and singing and praying and the privilege of, of giving and encouraging each other and, and so on. And so here is a practical application of this passage. I appreciate this, that we can enter God's temple in a sense today. We can come to worship God together as a group uh, with the joyous, overflowing attitude of thankfulness that this man had. So I appreciate this. In many ways, we are like this disabled beggar in desperate need, but not really knowing how truly needy we are until we come to know the Lord. And now he's healed us spiritually so we can react as he reacted by praising God fervently. And that's a real practical lesson I think we can learn here. Uh, the last two verses indicate that many people see this and those who see it are about as excited as he is. Uh, they see him leaping around praising God and they recognize him as being the one who used to beg at the temple gate. And they're also filled with wonder and awe at what's happened. By the way, many years before this, Isaiah spoke of a time coming in the future when the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will also leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. Isaiah 35, 5 and 6. And so this exact moment has been prophesied. Remember, the purpose of biblical miracles is not just to impress people. The purpose is to confirm the word of God, to prove that the person speaking is speaking on God's behalf. And if that's the case, which it is, we would expect Peter to actually say something. There needs to be a word to be confirmed by this miracle. And that's exactly what happens here. So let's continue on with Acts chapter 3, verses 11 through 16. Acts 3, 11 through 16. While he was clinging to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them at the so-called portico of Solomon, full of amazement. But when Peter saw this, he replied to the people, Men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Or why do you gaze at us? As if by our own power or piety we had made him walk. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, the one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, but put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. And on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus with which has strengthened this man whom you see and no, and the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. In verse 11, we find that they are now in the so-called portico of Solomon. As I understand it, this is perhaps something of a front porch to the temple. Basically, might have been part of an old retaining wall that was built by Solomon to level out the hill to give kind of a flat place to build the temple upon. Uh, some have speculated it might have been a piece of the new temple that was built with the remnants of the old temple. They kind of built a porch with some of the bricks that were still around from the first temple. So after the temple was destroyed by, by the Babylonians, either this part is a part that survived or it was rebuilt with pieces of it. And that's why it was called Solomon's Portico or Solomon's Porch. Um, Luke tells us this is where they are on Solomon's portico. And he also tells us that people are running together to this spot, uh, to this man who is still clinging to Peter and John. It's hard to imagine as a preacher preaching a sermon and having somebody 
wrapped around me, and that seems though that's what's going on here, and the crowd is full of amazement at what's going on here. So Peter, taking advantage of this attention, this is the purpose of it, he speaks to the crowd that's gathered together. And once again, as he did with the healing itself, he directs attention away from himself and directs it to Jesus. It's not because of Peter's uh, power or eloquence or piety, another way I think of saying righteousness, godly living kind of thing. It's not any of that that made this man able to walk. But he directs their attention to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of our fathers has done this. So this is not some new thing, but this has happened because the God all of us know has glorified his servant, Jesus. And so again, Peter points them to Jesus. And in this regard, this is starting to look very similar to Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2. Because not only does he introduce Jesus, but he goes on to accuse them of killing Jesus. And that's what he does in Acts chapter 2, right? He says, this is Jesus, but you killed him, and this is what you do about it. And that seems to be the same basic outline that he's using here. In verses 13 through 15, notice how Peter describes exactly what these people did. Number one, they deliver Jesus. That's a reference to the plot to arrest Jesus, to turn him over to Pilate. They took one of their own people, a Jewish man, and they delivered him to the Romans. Number two, they disowned Jesus, a reference to asking for the release of Barabbas, an insurrectionist and murderer, and, um, and also a reference to objecting to Pilate's description of Jesus as being the king of the Jews. Remember that? He's not the king of the Jews. He's not... <laughs> we're not claiming him, and so they disowned Jesus the Messiah, which also, by the way, is pretty much what Peter did, right? When he denied even knowing the Lord three times. So Peter's writing from a place of uh, that he understands right here. I've, I've done what you did. And then there are three, third accusation, they put to death the Prince of Life. In other words, this was not just a one-time mistake, but this is something they actually plotted and pressed over a number of days at the least. Some of them had been plotting for up to a year or more. In verse 15, Peter refers to the resurrection. Remember, the gospel is the good news about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and we have it right here. And we've all seen it, Peter says, a fact to which we are witnesses. And then in verse 16, Peter explains something we didn't see earlier that this healing happened because the man who couldn't walk had faith in his name. Not all miracles require faith in Jesus' name on the part of the one being healed. Uh, Jesus cursed a fig tree. Fig tree didn't have any role in that. You know, sometimes um, the man who was let down through the ceiling by his friends, I think uh, the Bible says that Jesus saw the faith of his friends and healed the man based on not his faith, but the faith of his friends. So it doesn't have to be personal faith that leads to a healing, but it seems that there was some faith in Jesus on this man's uh, part here. Um, and then we take it back to verse 6. We remember Peter did say, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene walk. And so I think we can probably safely assume here that if the man did not have faith in the Lord's name, uh, he probably would not have been healed because Peter specifically tells him uh, that the healing is in the Lord's name. So Peter continues on with verse number 17. So let's move on to Acts 3, 17 through 26, and this is where we will conclude tonight. We'll look at this paragraph and then wrap it up. So Acts 3, 17 through 26. And now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance, just as your rulers did also. But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Therefore, repent and return, so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus, the Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient times. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. To him you shall give heed to everything he says to you. And it will be that every soul that does not heed that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. And likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward also announced these days. It is you who are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. 
For you first, God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. We should probably note here that unlike what happened on Pentecost, the people do not interrupt Peter at this point. Instead, Peter goes on to explain how he knows that they acted in ignorance. Usually, it's not nice to accuse people of being ignorant. But here, as I see it, this is really the best possible scenario. The other possibility is that they knew Jesus was the Son of God and they killed him anyway. And so Peter assumes the best of them, though, that they actually acted in ignorance. And really, this, this is Peter. Peter acted in ignorance. If Peter had truly known what he was doing, there's a good chance that he would not have denied knowing Jesus on the night before his death. So I think Peter can identify with this, that Peter was ignorant at certain times uh, in those three and a half years that he interacted with the Lord. And so Peter's saying here, you all acted in ignorance. But ignorance is no excuse, is it? No, as he goes on to explain, we should have known better. All of you should have known better, but in fact, you did act in ignorance. In verse 18, all of this had been announced beforehand by the prophets. We should have known this. Um, so what do we do about it? As Peter says in verse 19, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away. As we discussed last week, to repent is to have a change of mind. To return is to turn around and to come back. And so, as I understand this, Peter is saying we are to turn away from sin. And at the same time, we're actually turning back to God. So, we don't just turn away from sin, but we turn back toward God. So, there is a turning away from and there is a turning toward. A negative and a positive, we might say. And when we do, he says that our sins will be wiped away. This comes from a word... Um, that is sometimes translated as canceled, wiped out, erased, or obliterated. Your sins will be obliterated. Your sins will be erased, wiped out. And this brings times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. In terms of the ABCs, uh, we studied this passage years ago with a, a good a Christian sister now who suggested the possibility of Changing your evil ways, as a summary of chapter 3. Changing your evil ways, not bad. Uh, in my mind, as difficult as it is, I'm still leaning toward Cripple Cured. I don't know. Um, again, let me know if you can think of something better, but it's either Cripple Cured or uh, Changing Your Evil Ways would be another, I think, pretty good summary of chapter 3 here. What about baptism? It's not here, is it? Is that concerning to us, that Peter didn't tell these people to be baptized? Well, we need to remember what we learned last week, that belief and confession of Jesus, of faith in Jesus as the Son of God, uh, they're not found in Acts 2.38. But that doesn't mean that they're not necessary. In fact, nowhere in Acts do we have every step in God's plan outlined in one single verse, but instead we need to take all of this together. God did not give us a set of bullet points. He gave us text. He gave us accounts of people explaining the gospel, and we need to combine all of this together. Uh, even here in verse 19, we really don't have a, a reference to belief, do we? These people are not commanded to believe, and yet very few people would say that repentance is the only step in God's plan. And yet, if you were to take this verse out of context, you could perhaps make that argument. So, I guess the point is, is the reminder that we need to take all of the Bible together. We have a rather difficult series of statements in verses 19 through 21, the reference to repenting so that God would send Jesus, and then the reference to the period of restoration of all things. A lot has been written on this, uh, but I would take this as a reference to the Christian age in general. We are now living in the period of restoration of all things. And we've been living in this period ever since the Lord's death and resurrection. This is the last days that we talked about in Acts chapter 2. This was uh, spoken of and predicted by the prophets. I don't know if we always think about Jesus as being a prophet, but Peter says that Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophecy made by Moses in Deuteronomy 18, 15, and 18, where God promised to raise up a prophet like Moses someone to be listened to, 
Jesus is that prophet. Therefore, he's making the argument here, we need to listen to Jesus. Jesus is the prophet like Moses. Uh, the threat is that those who do not listen to Jesus as the prophet like Moses, they'll be cut off and they'll be utterly destroyed from among the people. And, and it wasn't just Moses who predicted this. All of the prophets predicted this from Samuel onward. Peter turns rather positive, I think, in the last few verses here. Uh, you are the sons of the prophets. In other words, you can do this. You, you have a good history. You have people. You have a, a tradition here. Uh, God made this covenant with your fathers, uh, saying through Abraham that through his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Jesus is the seed. He is the descendant of Abraham. And you are now blessed because of this, because Jesus is turning people from their wicked ways. You can be a part of this. This is very encouraging. Uh, unfortunately, we don't seem to have 3,000 people baptized here and added to the church on this occasion, as happened in chapter 2, as far as we know. Uh, but we do have a reaction to it. And we'll save that for next week, because that continues over in chapter 4. So next week, let's pick up with Acts chapter 4. And remember, please be thinking of a word starting with the letter D. That summarizes what happens in chapter 4. Let me know beforehand if you can, so I can uh, get it in class and record that for everybody and get that out there. Uh, also, if you haven't done it already, even if you have, try to either read through or listen to the entire book of Acts all at once, if at all possible. Uh, it'll help us understand what's going on in this book. We get out of class what we put into it. As with any college class, you can just barely scrape by or you can read the textbook and then start looking up footnotes and, and go from there and get a lot more out of it. And that's the same with this. Um, when I got my second Pfizer dose last Thursday over in Brookfield... I listened to the entire book of Acts in the car on the way there and back again. I did it for the first Pfizer dose three weeks earlier. And again, it was a good experience. And I, I picked up on stuff that I had never noticed before, even though I had just done this three weeks earlier. Uh, it was just a, a faith building experience. So if you can somehow listen to the book of Acts on an app or maybe on a CD in the car or something like that, uh, I learn something new every time I do this, which is only twice now. Uh, but it has been very helpful, and I would uh, uh, highly recommend it. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to study with us tonight. I hope to see you all on Sunday at 9 or at 1030. And again, this would be a great time to sign up. If you don't have internet, get in touch with somebody who does, and just have them put your name down so we can know you're coming, and that really helps. So uh, let me know if I can help, and let me know if you have something that we need to be praying about. Let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You are the God who heals. I thank you for these words that we've studied tonight that have come to us through your servant, Luke. We pray that we would respond to being forgiven with the same enthusiasm that the man we've studied tonight has had. Thank you, Father, for these times of refreshing in which we're now living. Thank you for forgiving our sins. As we look at the suffering and the loss and the poverty in the world around us, we pray that we might help in ways that honor not only those we're trying to help, but we pray that we would honor you in that process as well. As we continually change our hearts, as we continually turn ourselves back towards you, we pray that we would not lose heart, but that we would constantly look to you for help. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. We come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.